Welcome to the Entrepreneurial Musician with Andrew Hitz, a podcast from the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network featuring interviews with the best and brightest entrepreneurs and innovators in the music business. Today's episode features Dr. Tim Lotzenheiser, a former college band director turned entrepreneur. Tim talks about how he stumbled into becoming a motivational speaker, the traits that all successful people possess, and shares the one entrepreneurial skill that every young band director should have. Next. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of The Entrepreneurial Musician. I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by one of my favorite human beings in the world, and I mean that quite literally, uh, Dr. Tim Lotzenheiser. How are you doing today, Tim? I'm great, Andrew, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to do this. This is going to be fun. And by the way, you're one of my favorite people, too. Oh, thank you very much. I'm not sure if you mean that, but I but I appreciate it. No, uh, I do. I don't think it's me. For those of you who don't know um, Dr. Tim, yeah. as he's known, are you even a real doctor? I got a couple of those things yeah, shoved got- around a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, I thought <laughs> that you did, so... Um, but uh, he's known as Dr. Tim uh, in music circles, and uh, he is uh, among uh, to only call him a motivational speaker would be uh, would be shortchanging you uh, a whole lot, which is why I uh, asked you to be on this podcast. But if you hear Dr. Tim give one of his uh, motivational uh, pep talks, then um, the common response is that you leave the room uh, ready to not only change the world, but start changing it like within five minutes. And you're also ready to run through a brick wall. So, um, and he does that for adults and, uh, for kids and for, um, everybody in between. Well, what's, what's between adults and kids? I don't even know. College students. Don't tell them I said that you're you're adults. I swear. Um, yeah, yeah, they don't like it when you call them non-adults. So I've learned that the hard way. Um, so anyway, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, um, about what you are up to today within uh, the music business, which you're into so much stuff that could take a half hour, but uh, just tell us uh, kind of the, the big headlines of what you're into today. Well, I mean, we're, we're always doing our workshops. Our little attitude concepts business is always going full blast. So that's that's 365 days a year. And then uh, <clears throat> I'm vice president for education for Conselma. Uh, and I'm, you know, an advisory business with Music for All Bands of America, have the same position at NAM, uh, writing some books for GIA. Uh, of course, there's all the Hal Leonard stuff with essential elements and, and on it. And I'm working with NAFNI with the Triumph thing. So, I mean, there's a no lack of work, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you, you are always, I don't know how, um, I, during my... 14 years with Boston Brass, I wasn't ever as busy as you are, and um, even somebody in my 20s and 30s during that time, I was exhausted by the time I got off that hamster wheel, so I really don't know how you keep doing uh, what you're doing nonstop. How, and actually, there's a good question. How do you how do you get the motivation to keep going as full throttle as you do? Well, that, that's a great question, Andrew, and, and you know, when you talk about when you're with the Boston Brass, I mean, you guys had Excuse me. You play, pack up, get in the car, drive three hours, sleep a couple hours, and start the whole thing over again. So um, it's a little hamster wheel. Uh, and you know, I played on the road for a while, so I know what that was like. Uh, I I don't consider what I do work. Um, when I grew up, I bailed hay. That was work. There you go. <laughs> you know, I I helped. Uh, I worked on the state highway and paved roads. That was work. <laughs> What I get to do is just hang out with great people like you. And, I mean, there's people that pay to have that option. So, uh, you know, that's why I get excited. That's why each day is wonderful. I'm different. You meet new people. and So hopefully it helps some people along the way. Yeah, that is one thing, that your your energy is um, is such that it's like – it's uncanny how it's always present. Um, I don't know how many days I've spent with you on the road over many years, but it's a whole heck of a lot of them that we were in the same place at the same state conference or the same national conference or, or running into you at O'Hare Airport or uh, yeah, in any, any number of places I've seen you. And every single day you seem to be, every time you seem to be having a good day. And um, 
and it's genuine. It's crazy. I mean, like, yeah, I, I think I know you well enough to be able to detect if it was uh, if it was bull crap. Uh, as we will, uh, this is family friendly, so that's as strong as I will go. But um, but it's like it's always genuine, and so you kind of shed some light there. That uh, yeah, I guess it does beat paving a road for a living, doesn't it? Well, and yeah, and, you know, there's people that when people are very positive, the, the cynics come out, as you know, in fold. Uh, but you know, I just it, it's wonderful. I mean. People get, again, like when, when we're together, when anybody's together and you have the opportunity to be around people, oh my gosh, how can you not take advantage of that and enjoy it? And, you know, we're spoiled. We're spoiled in yeah. a good way. Yep, I, I would agree. Um, let's, uh, uh, if we could, jump uh, jump back to your very uh, beginnings um, within the, uh, the, the music business and the music education world. What was your first job? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, when I finished, I, I went through um, uh, undergraduate and graduate school straight on. Uh, and then my first job was at Northern Michigan University. I was the uh, associate director of bands there. Uh, and then from there, I went to the University of Missouri in Columbia and was associate director of bands there. And did per I was teaching percussion all the time, uh, at, you know. And then I went to New Mexico State University and was director of bands there. And then um, I just couldn't keep a job, Andrew. I mean, it's just like it's not just <laughs> you and Lance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both the same way. Uh, and then I went to uh, work at McCormick's Enterprises, which was the housing body for Bands of America. And so I did the executive director job there. And so, what made enough, you? If I could interrupt, what made you jump from okay. being the director of bands at the university level to that job? Um, Larry McCormick, uh, who was the owner of McCormick Enterprise, incredibly smart and powerful and creative person. And, you know, the, the idea for me is to always help people. I always want to walk away and have them go, you know, I can be better, I can do better, and, you know, open some opportunities for them. And he was real convincing in about, I can give you a national platform to do that. Hmm. Um, and, and the other part is I love being a college band director. I love every part. I even like the bad parts of it. Um, <laughs> If, you know, here was a, you had to make a call. Are you going to do that and go up that, you know, uh, pipeline, or do you want to try something different? And I jumped. So. Very interesting. So the national platform was the was the the uh, yeah the siren yeah, that, that you word. responded to. So all right, sorry. Continue yeah. continue on the timeline. Um. So uh, then uh, we were doing those things and. Uh, uh, well, here's, here, I mean, it's really kind of a stupid story, but uh, we were doing workshops, and we would go in, and, and kids would come from all different schools, and they would do flags and rifles and brass and, <laughs> and all that. And so uh, one of the places we went, the um, the plane that had all of the other clinicians was late. And so Larry McCormick came to me, and he said, you know, we've got an auditorium full of kids, and they're not going to get here for four hours to do something with them. Hmm. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'll, I'll take the percussion. We'll see you later. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I went in. We talked about leadership and so forth. And then, Andrew, the many of those directors came to me and said, would you come to our school and do that? <laughs> and sure, I'll do that. And so it got to the point where I was spending more time doing that uh, than I was anything else. And Larry was so great. Uh, he said, you can keep doing it. But he said, somebody's got to, you know, hold down the fort here. Um, and so that's when we broke away and started Attitude Concepts, hmm. and that's how it started. And then it it was like wildfire. <laughs> wow how many how many stories in the music business are some form of that exact story that you just told? The oh, yeah. the, the plane is late, oh, yeah. the adjudicators, and so it's like you know they you're the you're the fourth string quarterback and then they say get in there and throw throw the ball to our team and not the other team and you did it so well that people came up and that's what I'm always telling my students that um and it's a very similar story to how I got into Boston Brass. Well, yeah. yeah. Yep, very yeah, similar. I mean, it's the same thing. Yep. It's the same thing. You, you, I mean we sort of pinball off of it and all of a sudden it's like oh my gosh, I'm here. Right. How that happened? Yeah. Every, everything everything uh, Andrew that has happened that is remarkable has always been by accident. It's never been by intent. Right. Yeah. So you got to keep the radar on. You know. When I was uh, when I was a little kid, um, Sam Palafian, uh, my mentor, who um, 
bizarrely took my job, which was funny. I, well, I gave it to him. I didn't. He didn't like steal it. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want him to get any nasty emails. The um, the maybe they were going to fire me a day after I resigned. I don't know. But uh, but anyway, that's my <laughs> that's my story. Is that I handed it over uh, willingly. But um, he told me when I was like a freshman in high school, he told me that it takes three things to make it in the music business. He said. Uh, takes a ton of talent it takes uh, a, even more hard work and uh, that it also takes a lot of luck and he said that the luck was uh, you know being in the right place at the right time and he then said that um, you know he pointed out that that we that we we can create our our own luck by being ready right. at a moment's notice for when that plane is four hours late and that you're the guy that's standing there and the 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 the, right. the path of least resistance to uh you know to your boss uh you know getting through that uh that day unscathed that you were then ready to to go ahead and and go in and what was going through your mind when you got on that stage was it was it hard was it easy were you nervous were you oblivious what was it like I, I suspect it was much like you when you did your first concert with Boston Brass. There's, you can't turn back. Right. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's like jumping off a diving board. Yep. <laughs> there's no way to get back up. Yeah. So, yeah, there's there's yeah. something to be said about, well, um, and I I try to always to bring this kind of focus to rehearsals and to practice sessions, but I think we can all agree that yeah. when you're in a concert, it's pretty easy to be focused because if you have to stop the band you're conducting or if you have to stop the brass quintet that you're one-fifth of uh you know to restart something like that's really not very ideal at all <laughs> so it's kind of easy there's consequences if you if you uh you know if your mind wanders at all or even wanders to thinking hey i'm doing a great job or hey i'm doing a horrible <laughs> job you know i mean either either one and um uh, and so yeah that's 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 very interesting so and so then the um so then your own thing kind of uh exploded from there well yeah in fact I, just to be perfectly honest i was uh i was going to go back and teach college i had uh had a, a relationship with h robert reynolds at michigan and he was looking for somebody and we were talking about that <laughs> and then during the I mean, the next four or five weeks, it's like, what am I doing? We're all booked for two months. And then it was like, well, we're booked for six months. And so, um, you know, I went that direction. Uh, we, we don't advertise, if you've ever noticed that. Right. <laughs> we don't market. Right. Uh, so we're blessed in that people come to us. Right. Uh, and because I, I, I don't think I, I wouldn't know how to do that. So I figure, you know, it's, it's like if you want to stand back and go, does life have a direction for you? And if you don't fight it real hard, it generally does. Right. Very interesting. You know, look, yeah, look, I mean, look at your own career. My gosh, you, you couldn't have scripted that in the whole world, Andrew. Yeah. You it was just showed up. Yeah, pretty, pretty, uh, yeah, and the fact that I grew up in Boston and then that I ended up uh, yeah, partway through the graduate degree getting a job in my hometown that I wanted to move back to, uh, yeah, it was... Yeah, it was kind of storybook in a lot of ways. That's for sure. So, well, and then meeting, and then meeting Lance, and then being around like like Pat and Sam, and you yeah. were around the right people, and they all love you, and it's like, holy gosh, you you, you can't plan that; it just happens. Yeah, it's true. No, it's uh, yeah, it's it's very true. It's very true. Well, um, here's uh, here's kind of a a very uh, open ended question that's hard to answer, so I'm going to ask you. Um, what, uh, you know, why do you think it is that you don't have to market yourself at all? I've got some ideas. So if you get the question wrong, I'll, I'll correct you. But, uh, what, you know, why do you think it is that your phone is constantly ringing and that you don't have to market yourself at all? Um, well, to me, all of success is about communication. Um, mm -hmm. and if you, if you communicate and you help other people get better, you, they want to be around, or at least they, they, they want to, you know, they want to be around you. You create trust relationships, and they know it's, there's going to be benefits. Um, and so, you know, and I don't want to be around, around a situation where they're going, oh, no, you forced yourself on us. Like, no, that's, that's like dating somebody you don't like or whatever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad, bad metaphor. But you know what I'm saying? And yes. So, uh, it's, again, people go to other people because of benefits. And you're a great communicator. I mean, you know, we, we, we won't hear from each other for four or five months, and then when we do, we, we start off right where we left off. Right. You know? And that's, you know, that, that's fun to do. 
So I don't know why people do it. Uh, and I don't ask, but I just know that we have a long waiting list. And it's developed some other people who now do that, you know, so that there's other people doing it. Yeah, it's it's interesting that that um, that kind of what you just touched on is that um, that when you go to um, and I've been lucky enough. Uh, one one thing that I can say is that um, that in my time with uh, with Boston Brass, when we were on the road, and any time that it was busy enough of a schedule, that any time that um, especially at a conference that we had the ability to kind of be out of the uh, spotlight and um, you know as you know when you're even just walking across a hotel lobby you kind of have to be on because if someone comes up and that's their opportunity to say hello to you then um, you know it's pretty rude to to not give that person time and so you're just kind of always on um, and uh, so you end up kind of spending some time just in your room by yourself ordering room service to just kind of get a little me time and that being said uh, when we weren't busy doing our own thing at one of these conferences, uh, it was not uncommon to have all five members of Boston Brass there individually at your sessions, uh, whether you were talking to kids or talking to, um, you know, I've seen you address a room full of band directors and a room full of high school students, room full of college students, kind of, and all of those uh, different scenarios. And we've all been to lots of them, and um, which is a huge compliment from us. <laughs> and uh, the thing that I always... Uh, that I always saw. I just interviewed um, the last episode was uh, a couple of guys from uh, Alarm Will Sound, the fantastic uh, mm-hmm. twenty-piece um, you know group that uh, is loosely based out of New York City. They've kind of uh, spread out now, but uh, but those two guys were talking uh, constantly about how. Uh, they firmly believe that a concert is an experience and um, that it's not just them creating great art and letting people look over their shoulder and because uh, their musicianship is absolutely phenomenal. All 20 of those people should be uh, paying their uh, mortgages and food and uh, packing away money for retirement just based on the amount of you know, the level of artistry. And yet, um, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, have those boxes checked that aren't and, um, you know, that... Uh, that they talk about an experience and that's kind of what I feel like you do is that when you're in a room with people that obviously if you're trying to motivate them and trying to help them, as you said, um, you need to be motivating and you need to be helping or uh, you're not going to keep getting paid, but it really is an experience to, to see you. And when it's an experience, it's powerful enough that people get on Facebook and yap about it and people get on Twitter and yap about it and people email people and they get on the, you know, Facebook band director group, and, you know, it's like everybody is uh, very eager to share what they've just experienced, and so your your marketing is actually done by your customers, which is uh, the best right. possible kind of marketing, which is which is really great. Well, I think, you know, you said something that triggered, and again, it comes back to the way you and I hooked up and the other guys hooked up, that your performance off stage may be more important than your performance on stage. Right. Everybody knows you're going to be. I mean, you know, you don't get on stage unless you're good. Right. So everybody knows you're going to you're going to be on your A game there. Right. But what's the person like off stage? And you know, you guys were just as genuine and as on and as excited as, in fact, even more. So then you know it's authentic. Then you know it's real. Um, you want to be around people like that. At least I do. I like I like I like life better when I'm around people like you. Oh, thank you. No, no I, because because two plus two plus two equals seven. Then Andrew, right? You know, and that's that's great synergy. Yeah, you are one of those great. people that the yeah the last time that I ran into you at O'Hare a few years ago, then yeah, I was just kind of like saw each other, and then there was just like huge smiles, kind of like, uh oh, what's about to happen? Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, um, my buddy. yep, and I think that that's uh, I think that that kind of thing is contagious. Have you read the book? Uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with Seth Godin, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, his book Lynchpin, which um, which I learned about uh, that book specifically from uh, Lance and I were doing a a, a, a an entrepreneurship uh, uh, clinic together, and he mentioned how powerful this book was. So I went and read it right away, and um, and he talks about um, yeah about about gift giving and just uh, you know going the extra mile and uh, and kind of like what you just said, just being pleasant to be around and uh having a positive energy and trying to help the people around you and um and and i think that that's uh it's funny because in some ways that has absolutely nothing to do with um with selling books um you know that you're writing for you know for uh, the publisher or 
um, you know, a lot of the specific things you do, and yet it's completely intertwined with absolutely all of it. Um, because, um, yeah, it's like you're, you're a brand like you and a very genuine brand. But, uh, when somebody hangs out with you in a room for an hour, then I think it's only natural that they're curious as to what the rest of your products are. And, uh, and then the products, oh, by the way, are really good, <laughs> you know, so yeah. that helps. Um, so well, I mean, go ahead. No, 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 please. Well, I was, I was just going to say uh, that I always admired um, that, that the guys would play a, a concert and people are standing and throwing babies at the end. And I mean, it was phenomenal. <laughs> they should have been. But to watch you go out and set, and whether it was selling CDs or just being there, they got to come up and get close to you. That was real. Right. You didn't go back in a bubble somewhere, right. you know. Uh, and I, I think that, I mean, that just propels the group. Um, Everybody wants to be around people like that. So that was one of, one of the best parts of your act was not the act. <laughs> right. <laughs> I will admit, actually, when I first joined, when I was when I was young, if uh, you know, if I if I didn't play um, up to the standard that I felt that I should have played at, uh, you know, there were a couple of times when I would just kind of stay backstage and just kind of uh, wallow in self pity, which for me looks <laughs> for me is for me is anger. It's like yeah, it's it's not you know, it's not sure. ideal. So um, it's not like the uh, oh, I should give that guy a hug uh, kind of uh, self pity. It's more like the I should. Probably Probably be a couple of more rooms away, <laughs> kind of self pity, but uh, which would just selfishly make it about myself, and um, you know. So, but then you then you get a little older, and then you realize that yeah, I never play quite as bad as I think, or as quite as good as I think. It's almost always well, somewhere you. somewhere in the middle. So, um, so I wanted to ask you um, about um, uh, about. Uh, partnering with uh, with Sam and Pat um, on the breathing gym and on that kind of stuff and how that uh, how that came to be. We had a little um, a, a company that was kind of a retail music thing. It was run by some of my students actually, but I in fact I didn't even have anything to do with it. And then when they said they were going another direction, <clears throat> I had just met Pat. And I mean, Pat is so great. I mean, he he could sell mud. <laughs> 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 and everybody would be excited about it and spreading it on their face and in their hair and, and going, this is the coolest thing ever, man. This is my day. Whoever came up with this. Um, and so, you know, Pat and I were together, and I'm like, well, do you guys want this business? Or I can shut it down. You guys can have it. And so, you know, they said, sure, we'll take it. And uh, and that was right when they were doing the breathing gym, Andrew. And then, I mean, it was the perfect vehicle uh, for the scaffolding to get the breathing gym out to people. Right. You know, it's, so another another major win win. Instead of going through a publisher or having to be on the seventeenth page of the catalog, they got center light. Right. Um, so that wow, that was pretty cool for yeah. everybody. That's pretty awesome. Cool. So, um, yeah, that's how, you know, it's one of those you, we ride. You ride in the car with somebody, and you get out and go, "Oh, we just started a profession." You know, it's one of those. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it, it is funny how those how those kind of things uh, work. Yeah, there's been there were a few conversations that I had with Lance, uh, you know, in the car uh, driving in between gigs, and um, and sometimes we would kind of set out to uh, try and solve the world's problems, and um, and then other times it just started with us being idiots, and then suddenly it would kind of morph into something like, wait a minute, we should pay attention. <laughs> these are yeah. these are good ideas, yeah, which we never get when we try to. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which there's that's, no, that's, that's when it happens. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh so uh one uh question for you about uh about which is funny because you were talking about marketing um, and about how you wouldn't know the first thing about that. And yet um, Pat shared that um, that Sam and uh, and his uh, first idea for the breeding gym was to um, was to have uh, you know the breathing gym be sold to tuba players, to euphoniums, to kind of low brass people, and um, that you were the person who was the the catalyst um, behind um, you know making it uh, available um, for um, a lot more than uh, than just low brass players. Uh, that it was uh, you know available for for all wins and um, and things like that, and uh, and then he said that. Uh, you were the the person who um, 
who told them to put the orange box um, at the very top of the breeding gym that said for band, chorus, and orchestral winds, and that he kind of credited you with giving permission to choir directors and to orchestra directors um, and and band directors at, at large uh, to, to, to purchase this and to use this with their students. Do you remember that going down? Can you comment on it? What what I remember is as they talked about it, I kept thinking it's applicable to everybody. Everybody breathes. Everybody does. I mean, I'm a I'm a percussionist, and one of the things that my teacher taught me was to breathe. To breathe with the phrase. To you know to watch. I mean, aren't the strings breathing? Aren't I mean, are we together? And um, so it's like, well, whoa, 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 we want some of this too. Just don't take it over there and with your tuba guys and you know shut the door. So it, it was out of um, a desire to bring it to everybody because it's just the coolest thing in the world. Right. And uh, yeah, it, it, it wasn't a marketing technique as much as it was a, a mission technique. I think. Hmm. Very interesting. It's to everybody. Well, the guy yeah. with the uh, with the MBA from Michigan, uh, that being Pat, uh, refers to it as a marketing thing. So. Um, so, but I think, I think you're both saying the same thing, but, uh, just differently. So, yeah. oh, that's great. Um, okay. So, uh, my next line of questioning is that you are, um, obviously a former band director as you, as you discussed, um, and you have worked with, uh, with tens of thousands of uh, band directors, uh, in this country, elementary, middle, high school, uh, college, um, there's, uh, as you very well know, and I know because I'm married to one, um, there's uh, a lot of entrepreneurial skills go into um, being a successful um, band director. Um, and I'm wondering if you could um, comment on the business skills that you needed uh, to successfully navigate that um, on a collegiate level and then the business skills that you have witnessed other people needing um, who have taught, um, you know, who, or who do teach uh, at a um, at a younger level from high school on down? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, this, what a great question, <laughs> because that's the essence of it. You know, uh, the number of people I have seen quit, leave the profession, Andrew, it rarely had anything to do with music. Yeah. Rarely. I agree. Uh, I mean, they're great musicians, and they loved it, and it was all the off-the-podium stuff. So uh, the successful ones, I mean, the, the foundation, you, you got to have your musical chops together. Of course. And, those, and that's, a, you know, that's a lifelong journey. Um, but the public relations, outreach, oh, we're back to communication, you know, dealing with parents, dealing with administrators, dealing with community leaders, how to involve them. You know, and all it comes down to is... How do you give ownership of this product to everybody so they feel responsible and want to be a part of it? Hmm. So, you know, any way you can do that. Um, but so many people just kind of think the world's going to come and sit down in their auditorium and listen, and that isn't going to happen. Right. Um, particularly, like in your case, <laughs> well, you were professionals. You had to recruit an audience. Right. Uh, you know, that was up to you to recruit it. So one of one of the, I just see so many people just like go, you know, they kind of shrug their shoulders afterwards and go, well, nobody appreciates us. Well, I'm not even sure they know what you're doing. Yeah. You know, get out there. Yeah, um, even if you're even if you're Canadian brass, uh, which is uh, you know easily the most well known uh, globally brass quintet today, if they if they disappeared tomorrow, um, and I don't mean to say that no one would notice, but the the world would absolutely keep turning you know so um there'd be a lot of tributes for a week or two or a month and they'd be heartfelt and everything but um but the world would be just fine without one more you know without without a professional brass quartet even the top one and so yeah you you have you always have to be recruiting an audience yeah you you're you're never not you're never not recruiting you're never not working you're never not and it's it's not a matter of, of manipulating people it's just a matter of explaining and communicating to people what what, what gift you have. And, and Andrew, we've got the greatest gift in the world. We've got music that everything you do with music is going to make you better. Right. <laughs> everything. Sure. You can't not get better. Right. And, uh, you know, for a parent to say, get your child in here, this is going to escalate them to a higher level of everything they do. So, you know, we're selling success. Right. So who doesn't want part of that, right? 
Yeah. So uh, here's a question for you. Um, uh, you know, frequently uh, young band directors, uh, especially ones that are right out of school, um, you know, that it's incredibly rare for them to take over some successful band program that has, uh, you know, boosters in place and has a supportive administration and has right. an instrument budget and has, uh, you know, a nice auditorium and uh, fundraising that's uh, been working for years and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, like, even one of those, let alone all six that I just mentioned off the top of my head are, are, are pretty rare. You're usually replacing somebody that... Uh, you know, it wasn't that good or maybe somebody that was good, but it's kind of a stepping stone type job to, to better ones, um, you know, uh, or it's in, a, uh, you know, it's not in the most affluent area uh, or school district, et cetera. So um, for a young band director who is taking over a, um, you know, a, a program that's uh, that's not the one that they're going to end their career with, um, how, you know, what skills would they What's an example of something that they could do to help um, the people, as you said, kind of take ownership of the product from the students up through the administration? That's, man, you got good questions, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm, I'm married. I'm married to one of the best band directors in the world, so I, I get to hear her talk to all of her other uh, successful, it's really great band directors. Are like really good looking people, you know, like they hang out with other really good looking people, you know, like and really good band directors hang out with other really good band directors. So I get to just be a fly on the wall until I can't take the band talk anymore, and then I go and uh, watch baseball or something. But uh, but anyway, so yeah, back to the question. Well. Um, you know, let me back up philosophically to one more one more thing. Sure. Where we get where we get in trouble generally is dealing with the ego. What is it they say? Every problem that there exists come back to the human ego. Right. That we start to make it about ourselves instead of about the people around us. Right. And you know, if you go in and 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 you can show the parents that you're going to make the kids better, you got buy in immediately. Right. If you show the administration, administrators, you're going to make the school better and make their job better, you got buy-in. If you show the community that that band is there behind them and we want to be there the, for the laundromat openings and the grass fires or whatever, we'll have some music there for you, then it's their band, not your band. Right. It's the community's band. It's the school's band. It's the kids' band. And um, so that means I have to step back. And I can't take credit for it. I'm just the navigator. Right. You know, I'm the ringmaster. But it's theirs. And when people have ownership, for the most part, they'll be responsible. When they don't have ownership, whoop, you know, I can walk. Huh. So. so that sounds uh, very similar um, to the... Um I mean, to the answer about uh, how you got into the motivational thing and how you continue to succeed with it is that um, when the when the the kids um, you know in the band are are bought in, um, then uh, and oh by the way, the other thing is that generally that whoever the person that uh, you're replacing, um, you know, the kids will have probably liked them. And then when you do anything differently, um, you know, whether it's your eighth graders or your seniors or whatever, who have, you know, earned their right to be at the top of the pile. And then all of a sudden you completely change things. They're not going to like you very much, <laughs> you know? So, um, but well, uh, people but, don't like change. Exactly. People just don't like change, yep. you know, just because you have to rethink and people don't like to think particularly. They like it just um, same here. By the way, you know what do you what do you how did you why did you move that restaurant? Yeah, that's where I once went. Now I got to redo that whole thing, and it goes back to I me again. Right, and you know, so that's the on, ongoing you know and it is battle with all these. It is all communication. Yeah, my um, my wife was at a uh, at a former school. She's been at a lot, so I, it doesn't uh, won't reveal too much. It's not the one she's at now, but uh, where the person that she took over for was uh, was we'll just say very very different than uh, than she um, was in a lot of ways. And um, and yeah, the there was a a lot of pushback uh, at the beginning of the year, um, like a lot of pushback. Um, and uh, then fast forward to the uh, you know about two thirds of the way through the year and um the band that had been getting 
uh, like, uh, and my wife is, is very much not all about assessment and, uh, you know, the number and, you know, having that define your value as an educator or the band's uh, ability level. But the band that had been getting like straight threes got straight ones and they like both of them, the top band and the second band. And they basically carried her off stage, like the end of Rudy. I mean, you know, it's like the, the parents, the kids, the administrators, uh, everybody so um and she just kind of stayed the course and uh and kept making it not about herself so um yeah good uh yeah, good insight um all right here's another one that you work with a lot of uh, aspiring young um uh, band directors uh, at uh con selmer uh, university in fact can you why don't you give a little explanation slash plug for that uh, and then i can finish with the question well, I mean, um, it started at Selma University and then Selma University and then Selma Institute. So the names morphed a little bit. Got it. But what it, it, it the, the origin of it or the idea of it, Andrew, was to bring in, um, college kids who were getting ready to go out and hit the ground running and surround them with people who had been incredibly successful in the profession. And then the theme was, if I was your age and knew then what I know now, this is what I would do differently. Hmm. So that was what it was about. And I mean, you know, people bid on it. I mean, you stand around a Paula Kreider, <laughs> right? Tell me, tell me everything you know, so I won't stub my toe on those same things. Yeah, sure. And, and of course, all all the people we surrounded them with are very giving, open, positive, sharing people. Right. So that you know. It's like playing. It's like playing one on one with Michael Jordan. Right. He's going to get better. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Um, way back when, uh, funny story, and then I'll get to my question. Uh, yeah. That uh, when when Boston Brass was with Con Selmer, and um, and we were, you know, we went and um, and did a presentation and played for the folks there. Um, I remember uh, we were in the slot that was right after lunch, and we got to the hall at like. At twelve fifteen, and um, and it was like a, a one o'clock hit, something like that. Needed to warm up, and the only chairs that were in the auditorium um, all had arms on them, and so it was not it was not easy to to warm up. And and there was just you know, and there was nobody around to help us with because uh, everybody was at lunch. So um, so anyway, I went out into the into the lobby. And I saw a chair um, that was uh, that was perfect that had no no arms whatever and I grabbed it and I was just gonna kind of you know bring it back after we were done and um, and and Rick DeYoung, who was the uh, the artist uh, rep uh, who is now at uh, Jupiter Band Instruments who you know well and right. was at Con Selmer at, at the time yep. um, he yep. uh, he kind of uh, sheepishly came up to me at about like uh, you know ten minutes till one and he said uh, he said hey Andrew and I said hey Rick and he said where um where did you uh, where did you get that chair and I was like oh well there was no chairs with without arms and you know, I needed to warm up and so I. I saw one out, you know, out in the lobby area, and so I grabbed it. And he said, um, "He said, yeah, did you did you by any chance notice that uh, that you t- that you took that chair from the Wenger exhibit?" <laughs> <laughs> and, I like, <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't notice that, but it's a really nice chair. And he was just shaking his head like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah, I was like, that was one of the more creative. And I'm trying to think of her name. She was awesome. But I went out and just absolutely like I, I got down on my knees, fell on my sword. I was like, I play the tuba. It's not my fault. I And she thought it was hilarious. And I we actually I gave them like five plugs during the one hour presentation. And um, and I gave them so much plugs that they actually ended up sending me a chair for free free a month later um, uh, kind of as a joke yeah it was but it was very funny that i i actually stole a like the product that they were there to um yeah so there you go i'm, re- I'm really smart so uh so i'll bet it was, jo- I'll bet it was jody wasn't it uh, it was jody little, little, yes it was jody, jody. yes yep. oh, you got the right person you yep. got an angel on that yep. oh yeah, yeah she was great she <laughs> thought it was hilarious so but yeah she was oh, yeah. T- trying to look like she was upset but she was not successful at, at not <laughs> laughing because she was like yeah that's yeah you genuinely didn't it. realize that you were stealing from our booth that's pretty good you know so <laughs> I knew I was stealing from a booth, but I thought it was just the chair that someone sat down on, you know, and that I was going to make it Rick's problem when he got back to find me a different chair and bring it back. I just didn't really notice that, you know, it's That's like stealing great. a marimba from the marimba booth. It's kind of like, yeah, you don't don't really do that. So, um, but I did. So, um, I love it. all right. So the question is, uh, through things like the Conselmer Institute, um, you are, um, or, uh, or ABC, which are, um, you know, the American band college, which is obviously all actual directors, but they're younger directors. 
um, you've you've had a lot of uh, very intimate exposure with uh, a lot of young band directors. What would you say is the most common entrepreneurial skill that young band directors are lacking? Oh, man, why are you getting these questions? These are like doctoral <laughs> dissertations, man. <laughs> these are great, Andrew. Thanks. You write books about these. Um, here's, here's the key, and it's probably two for everything. You have to give up giving up. The hmm. Persistence alone is omnipotent. Hmm. And if you stub your toe, get back up and get in the game. You talked about when you didn't think you played well and you go backstage and you know, and beat yourself up and howled against yourself and everything. That was the worst use of time ever. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, agreed. I mean, we're all our own worst critic. Right. So that we can always, in, instead of saying, no, I've got to go on. And wh- what it obviously taught you was, this is this doesn't make any sense. I need to use this time to go on. And that's what I see with directors. They'll, they'll hit the wall and bounce back. And, and you know what they say? Argue for your limitations and you get to own them. Hmm. And so, you know, let's go on. Try the next path. That didn't work. Try the next one. Thomas Edison went for the light bulb 10,000 times. Wouldn't you have quit somewhere in there right. and said, I'm not getting it? And then when he hit it, well, I mean, he's Thomas Edison. Right. So, you know, the, the, there, there always is a yes. We just don't know how many no's you've got to get through before you hit the yes. But there's always a yes on the other side. Interesting. And so, you know, you look at your persistence. Good grief. There's times you could have pulled off anywhere and gone another direction. And out of it, you have a great career. You're a great player. You've got a beautiful wife. You've got a great pro. I mean, you family. Good grief. And those are all yeses. Yeah. Yeah, I know that for me growing up that um... – that you know, as I was, you know, as I was hoping to have a career in music, that that the one thing that I, that I'd kind of made an agreement with myself that the only thing that was not okay was for me to be seventy five years old, uh, you know, sitting on a rocking chair, um, you know, and not having gone into music as a profession, and then not being able to say that I hadn't done absolutely everything I possibly could have to make that happen, and uh, and I was going to be okay if I gave it the old college try, as the cliche goes, and that it just wasn't meant to be, and I was interested in maybe getting an MBA, and you know, um, which ironically is what Pat did after winning a job with the, with the Marine Band and then quitting, and. Uh, when I interviewed him, I actually didn't know this, that he had no intentions of coming back to the music business, that he, he didn't, uh, like when he got his MBA, I did not know that. So, um, but I just right. didn't want to, I didn't want to, yeah, leave anything. Um, there's so many horrible sports uh, cliches, you know, like leave it all on the field or, like, you know, whatever. But I just, um, exactly. yeah, I wanted to, to make sure that I could, in my heart of hearts, say that I had, uh, you know, kind of done everything that I could. So, well, how how is uh, here's another super open ended question. Um, you know, how does <laughs> how does a young person, um, you know, how do you practice perseverance like that, and especially perseverance under pressure? Because when you've got an administrator yeah. or angry yeah. parent or whatever, then it, it kind of feels more real than just a college professor who's uh, bearing down on you. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think we all have to have mentors. We all have to have people that we go to, and it's sort of like a Tesla car. You've got to pull over and charge now and then. Right. It's a great car, but you still got to charge it. Right. And uh, I don't know what you do. Uh, I mean, for me, being around you guys, I mean, was was always a charge. Right. Uh, so you look around for people who have made it, and if nothing, you just rub up against them and go, hey, I'll buy you a burger. Tell me how you did it. And all you got to do, Andrew, is change the noun, and it works. I mean, what they did, just change the noun, reset it on you, and go, boop, I'll give that a shot. <laughs> Work for somebody. Right. You know? Hmm. And you're around, you're around Pat, you're around Lance, you're around Sam. Those people, they will not quit. No. <laughs> they don't have an off button. None of them do. <laughs> Look at you. They don't have any off buttons. Yeah. So... That's actually a remark you know, that Lance LeDuc's ex-wife has made before. Um, yeah, but, but I'm not having an off button. <laughs> you know, if you keep rolling the dice, eventually you're going to hit. Sure. Yep. So, no, that's it. Yeah. That's why you're good. Very interesting. <laughs> um, so um, what... Um, uh, do you have any... So, so basically your advice to, um, to a young band director is uh, kind of anticipate 
anticipate difficulties and um, and just figure out a different way to get around it? Yeah, well, I mean, and I think this is a, such an important one, particularly for young band directors. Do everything you can to be yourself. You know, if you're going to try to be like somebody else, you're always going to be second best. You're not going to be the real deal. Right. So to look inside yourself and say, you know, uh, somebody, I, I'm not, you know, for example, I'm not a person that would jump and shout. So my teacher did, but I'm not going to do that. But boy, I'm really good, you know, with focusing kids down at a side. I mean, who are you? And then amplify that. Um, that's the hard one to do because we all get scared and survival comes up and Maslow's screaming in our ear and, you know, all those things. But uh, be yourself and just keep plowing forward. You know, I, I was with... Um, Eric Quinemeyer, the blind guy that climbed the uh, 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 Mount Everest, right. you know, he's blind. He's pers- and I, I was so fascinated, and I finally got to have lunch with him, Andrew, and I said, how did you do it? He says, oh, that was easy. He said, I just could put one foot in front of the other. Right. And I said, well, God, weren't you scared? He goes, Tim, I couldn't see. <laughs> 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 he didn't. He, he he didn't see any risk at all. <laughs> right. That's really funny. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. God, what a lesson! What a lesson! It is kind of all about yeah. perspective, isn't it? It really is, isn't it, pal? It really is. Yeah. The, the and thing... have you ever noticed the people that succeed like you? Whatever they're doing, they're successful at. And unfortunately, it's true the other way too. Successful people do not know how not to be successful. They don't have any tools for it. <laughs> so you can't lose when you get in that game. Unfortunately, it's true on the other side, too. Right. So. Yeah, the perspective thing, uh, I'd, I'd never really heard it put the way that you did just in terms of the ego thing, but that's um, that's absolutely true. I heard somebody recently said that an ego can only do two things. It can only um, either attack or defend, and that neither one of those right. is a useful life skill at all. <laughs> so. That's um, right. Yeah, neither one of those uh, skills makes uh, yeah makes a, a band feel like they own it, or um, makes yep. a good motivational speaker, or is good uh, negotiating a salary, or you know, or any of the above. So, but Absolutely. boy, is that an easy thing to say and a hard thing to do. At least it was for me when I was when I was young. I remember why well, a story popped in my head uh, when you were talking about that stuff. That um, uh, in terms of me getting frustrated occasionally, that we were. Uh, we had a concert that was being recorded for a um, – uh, it wasn't being broadcast live, but it was being recorded for a broadcast on NPR. Uh-huh. And um, uh-huh. we were doing uh, J.D.'s uh, – J.D. Shaw's gorgeous uh, arrangement of the uh, the Largo from the New World Symphony, um, mm-hmm. which uh, I don't know how J.D. used to be able to play those melodies at like – it was like quarter under equals 35 or something, just obscene, and, and it was just – it was gorgeous. My part was pretty easy. I just had to play long notes steadily. But um, the the very first chorale, I cracked the first note of the entire thing, and it was like a really good one. It was like it's. I think it's still ringing in that hall in Illinois, wherever the heck it was. And um, <laughs> and I and that was when I was young, and I wanted to. Th- I I momentarily thought about throwing my tuba about twenty five rows into the <laughs> audience. You know, so. Um, and all that was was ego. I mean, that's not that's not the way to play a beautiful second note. <laughs> You know, so, um, and it's true with business stuff too. I think we've both been on both sides of that where you've got some, um, that's one of the reasons why I absolutely love, uh, why Lance and I, after we left Boston Brass, why we have partnered with Pedal Note Media and with the podcasts and we're writing a book together and, um, you know, and, and all that stuff is that, is that he and I are, um, he's really good at it. I'm getting better at it just in terms of if we have an idea that we're sure is going to be a good one that, um, not not that you quit on it, not that you're not persistent, but uh, sometimes it's just it's the right idea in the wrong time, and so you bail on it and you go with something else, or it's the right idea, but you're not executing it right and you know just kind of constantly being ready to pivot. So, yeah. Um, yeah. which I kind of hear, and, and there's no room for ego there, you know, so. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yep. Right. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Yep. So, well, Tim, this has been fantastic. Um, the uh, do you uh, do you have any any parting words of uh, of wisdom for um, music educators uh, in terms of being entrepreneurs? Well, I mean, first of all, we're we're all salesmen. Nobody, you know, we, we we label ourselves artists. 
but we you mean selling our art. People have to come to here, otherwise we just stay in practice and play all the time. Right. So we have to we have to embrace that reality. The other thing is to admit that that music is where we're going to cure cancer. It's going to be in there somewhere. Some musician's going to trigger something in his or her mind, and it's going to come from the creative side of the mind. So the potential is endless. And I think what you and Lance are doing with this, I mean, and I love you guys both. I, I make no bones about it. I mean, I really love you guys. And what you're doing is creating a pathway for everybody to launch. You know, it's like a drawbridge. This, 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 this whole radio thing is like a drawbridge. All they got to do is walk over it, and they can get to the next level. So I compliment you both and hail you and go, <laughs> you're on the right pathway again. <laughs> excited about it oh thank you very much yeah if you get on like uh if you get on dozens of pathways then a couple of them end up uh going the right direction so that's what i'm yep. figuring out so yeah i used to have a nice simple uh you know I'll, i play tuba in a brass quintet called boston brass and now the answer is a lot more complicated <laughs> so the main <laughs> job is chasing around a one-year-old so uh but uh which is which is <laughs> which is awesome that's a little bit of a it's actually changing a one-year-old's diapers is some of some similar skill sets to being a road musician but uh but we won't we won't get into that. So, um, well, thank you, Doctor Tim, so much uh, for your uh, your always positive and always uh, energetic message. And um, I know I've learned a lot, and hopefully the uh, the listeners have as well. Yeah, thank you, buddy. I love you a lot, and I want I want to know about all the successes this is going to bring to not only you, but to give away to everybody else. And that's what makes it really valuable. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay. You've been listening to The Entrepreneurial Musician with Andrew Hitz on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to help support the podcast in order to make more episodes like this one possible, please visit pedalnotemedia.com slash donate for more details. You can sign up for my monthly newsletter and find my blog at andrewhitz.com. You can also find me at facebook.com slash hitstuba and I'm at hitstuba on Twitter. The Entrepreneurial Musician is produced by Austin Boyer and Buddy Deschler of the Fredericksburg Brass Institute. Executive producer is Andrew Hitz. The theme music was performed by Ben Barron, Rich Kelly, Daniel LaPelle, and Andrew Hitz. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.